Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this morning's talk on data privacy at scale. Uh, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, who here has heard of uh, GDPR? So probably uh, everybody at this uh, uh, point. Um, like most, many of you have probably been working on uh, privacy-related uh, things in the past year. And today, uh, me and Isak are going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've uh, built at LinkedIn uh, to you know, enhance um, our uh, privacy. So quick introductions about ourselves. My name is Anthony, and this is uh, Isak. And we're both engineers at LinkedIn uh, on the data management team. Uh, Isak uh, works more on the data ingestion side of things uh, using uh, Apache Goblin, which is an uh, ingestion framework that we developed at LinkedIn that is now an Apache project. Uh, and I work on LinkedIn's uh, homegrown uh, data access layer uh, called uh, Dolly. Um, so today, we're going to talk about uh, what sort of uh, you know, privacy issues uh, there are in, in light of uh, recent regulations, such as uh, GDPR. Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, in uh, you know, building a system to uh, uh, support uh, those uh, rules? Uh, and then we'll dive into the technical details about how we actually uh, implemented uh, the system. And we'll end with some concluding remarks. Uh, so uh, first, a uh, quick overview. Uh, many of you probably use LinkedIn. Um, our, our vision is to create economic opportunity for each and every uh, member of the global workforce. And one of the ways that we're trying to do this is to create a digital mapping of the entire uh, economy. So that means uh, having a representation for every member of the global workforce, uh, representing every job, every company, every university, every skill that you might need um, you know, to apply for any of these uh, jobs. And as you can tell, this is a, a massive uh, amount of data. And um, with this uh, you know, massive amount of data comes sort of uh, you know, this uh, data paradox. Um, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, you're providing this uh, data. You're joining the network because you want to connect with other people. You want to be found. You want to uh, figure out what skills uh, you might need, what uh, jobs you might be interested in applying to. But at the same time, uh, you know you want your personal information uh, to be uh, protected. And in light of uh, recent regulations, um, you know uh, we've taken this opportunity to kind of double down on and enhance um, the privacy supports that LinkedIn uh, offers. Um, so. Uh, that means that you know things uh, should be private by default. Uh, that you know you must give consent before we can use your data. And if you decide to close your account, uh, we must uh, delete uh, your your data as well. So for today's talk, we're going to focus primarily on uh, the right to be forgotten, uh, for deleting data uh, when members uh, close their accounts. Um, so in designing a, a system for this, we try to keep uh, a few uh, you know, core principles uh, in mind. Uh, given the large number of data sets uh, at LinkedIn, uh, we strove for our uh, system to be uh, easy to use, uh, comprehensive, um, you know, easy to uh, detect and fix uh, problems, and you know, able to support you know, many different uh, types and formats of uh, data. Um, we realize there's a lot of data set owners at LinkedIn, and we're always uh, creating new data sets. And we need to make sure that our system uh, can easily onboard uh, these new uh, data sets and ensure that new data that arrives every day uh, also remains uh, in uh, compliance. Um, so specifically, you know, to support uh, this use case of uh, deleting uh, you know, closed member uh, data, we want to make sure we have a, a, a few capabilities uh, that we support. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, we have many different uh, data systems that use different data formats. Um, so at LinkedIn, we primarily use um, Avro and ORC today. Uh, but you know, tomorrow, a new format may come around, and we need to be able to be format agnostic. And, uh, purge um, all of these uh, data sets. Um, purging closed member data is uh, one of the major use cases uh, for us. But we realize that this um, uh, framework can be generalized to uh, support other kinds of entities as well. 
um, subscriptions or enterprise accounts or even posts or uh, comments. Uh, this can be a, a very general uh, deletion uh, framework. Um, and to support the large number of data sets and the large number of new data sets that we have, uh, we need some defaults in place uh, you know, to scale to, uh, to our size. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we realize that given our complex uh, business uh, use cases, that uh, there's going to be uh, very specific business and legal requirements that we need to comply with. And so our framework, our deletion framework, needs to be able to support customization uh, to, to adapt and support all of these uh, uh, use cases. And finally, we need you know, continuous uh, monitoring to detect any uh, errors or violations that might uh, come up. So uh, let's talk about some of the challenges that uh, you know, come along with uh, building this system. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the data comes in different formats. Uh, you know, we have many different platforms and uh, schemas. And you know, though we have uh, best practices for uh, you know, schemas that you should create for your data sets, uh, you know, inevitably, uh, given the large number of data sets, uh, you know, there are you know, all sorts of uh, complex uh, schemas, nested schemas. Um, you have uh, arrays and uh, maps, you know, nested inside one another. And our framework needs to be able to process all of these data sets and, you know, find, uh, you know, personal information inside all of these fields and be able to uh, purge them. Um, and, you know, Purging closed member accounts is our primary use case, uh, but not every single one of our data sets is necessarily indexed uh, by that. Uh, furthermore, you have uh, data sets that, say, uh, track a message sent between one member and another, uh, and if one member closes their account, the, you know, the other member should still be able to see that uh, message. Um, and you know these uh, member uh, references uh, might be part of uh, composite fields that consist of a member ID as well as say a subscription ID, and so we need to be able to understand that as well. And given a large number of uh, data set owners, uh, we realize that not all of them have the know-how to you know write uh, Hadoop jobs or, or Spark jobs to uh, purge all of these uh, data sets. So we wanted our uh, system to be very easy to use. Um, and simple for uh, all of LinkedIn. So those are some of the you know, data challenges. Um, we also have some scale challenges. Uh, at LinkedIn, we have uh, a dozen Hadoop clusters, uh, tens of thousands of data sets uh, spread uh, across them, uh, over uh, 15 petabytes of data. And every day, we have um, thousands of uh, you know, engineers using this uh, data. Um, you know, running tens of thousands of uh, pig jobs, hive jobs, spark jobs, uh, et cetera. And um, we're also ingesting about 100 uh, terabytes uh, every day. Uh, so just processing all of this uh, data in, in and of itself is a big uh, challenge. And finally, um, uh, as many of you know, um, HDFS uh, is uh, append uh, only. So if you want to delete a record in the middle of a file, uh, you basically have to rewrite uh, the entire uh, file. So of course, uh, in order to scale this, uh, we need to batch uh, delete requests uh, together and process uh, many of them in the, the same uh, pass uh, through our data. And we already leveraged uh, Goblin uh, to update our data, to incrementally ingest uh, uh, our data and take uh, database uh, snapshots. And Goblin already supports uh, you know, uh, a framework for parallelizing this work and taking checkpoints and keeping track of where uh, we've left off. Uh, so it's a, a natural uh, fit for um, kind of this data deletion uh, problem uh, as well. So now um, uh, I've kind of explained to you the data deletion problem and uh, the challenges that come along with it. Uh, now I'd like to dive a little bit into uh, our actual uh, implementation and how we solved uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, so the first thing you need to figure out is what are all my data sets and uh, you know, what do I have to delete? Um, so um, 
Our biggest uh, form of uh, data is uh, in the form of uh, tracking events. So these are uh, page views, these are you know, ad impressions or, or search actions, and all of these are, are logged and uh, sent to Kafka, and then these Kafka streams are then ingested into HDFS. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of online databases. We use Oracle, MySQL. We have our homegrown system called Espresso, and we're taking uh, you know, regular snapshots of these uh, databases and putting them in our HDFS uh, warehouse. And uh, you know, all of these data sets, they may contain uh, member, uh, member uh, data or you know, company IDs uh, or subscriptions, uh, et cetera. Um, and so we first need to catalog uh, all of this. And at LinkedIn, um, about three or four years ago, we uh, built a system called Warehouse. This is uh, open source. You can find it on LinkedIn's uh, GitHub. And it's essentially a metadata uh, catalog. Um, and uh, it uh, contains uh, uh, all of uh, LinkedIn's uh, data sets. And it tells you the schema of the data set, as well as the owners uh, of uh, the data set. So in light of uh, GDPR, uh, you know, we've enhanced it uh, to allow data set owners to tag um, fields as um, you know, uh, name or email or, or phone number, what have you, um, so that we know uh, what to delete. Um, and we've tried to automate as much of this uh, as possible. Um, so uh, we've uh, built some machine learning models uh, to kind of infer uh, what uh, these fields should be uh, tagged with uh, based on the content of those uh, fields. And uh, data set owners can then uh, sign off uh, on that. Uh, here's a picture of the a warehouse UI. Uh, this is the uh, member account registration uh, data set. And you can see that. Um, in addition to the member ID, we have uh, their name and uh, the time they uh, registered. Um, and uh, you know, on the left here, you have kind of the schema, whether it's a numeric or a, a string field. Um, and then on the right, you have these additional uh, metadata tags, um, such as uh, name or member ID. And our uh, deletion framework can, can leverage this uh, to you know, either delete records or anonymize uh, our records, as the uh, case may be. Um, but metadata in and of itself uh, pre presents uh, some uh, challenges, right? Um, you know, what if the metadata is incorrect? You might, uh, you might not anonymize something you should. You might uh, accidentally delete something you uh, shouldn't be. So you need to account for uh, that. Um, like the data can evolve over time. So um, a given schema might have a new field uh, added to it. Um, you know, an existing field might only contain uh, member IDs today, but tomorrow it could contain uh, enterprise uh, IDs as well. So we need to support uh, you know schema evolution. Um, and as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, the member IDs, they can be in all sorts of uh, different formats, uh, either numeric or in this uh, URN uh, uh, format or some uh, custom format, or, you know, nested inside uh, other fields. So there's a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, use cases that uh, we need to uh, support. Um, so once you have this metadata, uh, we need to know, like, which uh, members have closed their accounts, uh, which uh, you know, uh, subscriptions have been uh, closed. And the way we uh, figure this out is we have uh, online applications uh, emit Kafka events uh, that tell us uh, what to delete, which entities uh, to delete. And we take these uh, entities and we write them to uh, a MySQL database, and we store them in a, a compressed uh, bitmap. Um, and then at runtime, when our purging framework is processing these uh, data sets, uh, we can then load this uh, uh, lookup table from our, our database, and then um, for every record, check if it's uh, been deleted or not, and take appropriate action as uh, need be. Um, so now um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Isak, uh, who's going to uh, tell you more about uh, how do we actually carry out uh, the deletion process. Isak. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so Anthony has talked so far on how we figure out which data sets perhaps uh, need to be 
cleaned up, how do we know exactly which identifiers need to be deleted from them, which members or jobs? And it might seem that that's enough, uh, that that's already enough to do the cleanup. It turns out there are, uh, if you want to support certain business operations, there are other things that you need. And uh, so we get into how exactly do we delete, uh, how do exactly, what do does it mean to clean a data set? Uh, so we can start with a generic data set, a simple one that we can do default cleaning on. So we have some model data set that has a key that is a member ID. And in this uh, metadata system, it has been annotated as a member ID. Well, we can actually fairly simply just, it's a member ID. We can load the lookup table that contains all of the, uh, all of the identifiers that need to be cleaned up. At this point, it doesn't really matter why it needs to be cleaned up, just that it needs to be. And we can do a filter, pretty much. Uh, uh, we're calling this a map join filter. If, you're, if you've used Hive, you know what map joins mean in Hive. If you haven't, this means that this lookup table gets loaded in memory. The entire table gets loaded into memory. So we can scan over the data set and do constant time lookups uh, in this lookup table. And that allows us to clean an entire data set in a single pass. Um, and this works great for all of the, like, uh, maybe 90% of the data sets that uh, where everything is clear. However, this is not the end of the story because there are different business needs for other data sets. Uh, maybe some of them we don't just want to delete records. Maybe we want to do some modifications to de identify them. Um, or maybe even it's not actually trivial to find the member ID in one of these data sets. We have to run some complex operations over multiple fields to figure out what the, what the actual member contained in there is. And for this, uh, we need to provide users with a way to tell us how to, uh, how to process their data set. Um, we went uh, on for SQL in here uh, as uh, the grammar for users to tell us what to do with their data set. Uh, why SQL? Well, it turns out that a lot of the data owners are not necessarily experts in Java. Uh, they may not know what the cost of certain operations are. But most data analysts know uh, at least some SQL, and at least enough SQL to tell us, well, you can combine these two fields to tell me uh, to figure out what the member ID is. Um, SQL, if if you just want to project a few uh, rows, uh, a few columns, it's very simple, but it, it's also very expressive if you want to do more complicated stuff. And uh, certain SQL engines also support UDFs, uh, user-defined functions. So if the user somehow feel, uh, feels more comfortable with Java than writing some complicated SQL, they can always expand uh, what this uh, logic does. We support, uh, we sort of divide these expressions into two kinds of expressions. Uh, row filters, which just tell us, okay, given a row, you can apply this expression to get a Boolean, yes or no, this row should be filtered. And this is essentially a where clause. Uh, on the other hand, m there are more sophisticated column transformations that say, uh, sure, I want to keep this row. However, this particular field should be replaced by the result of this expression, and this other field should be replaced by this other result. Uh, in some way, this is a, a complicated select clause. Uh, we make it uh, easier for users by they just tell us field foo needs to be replaced by the result of this UDF, for example. And of course, you can combine uh, row filters and column transformations. You can compose multiple uh, row filters. For example, you can say, hey, apply the default filter, but also apply these other filters. Um, we have a very rich, dynamic uh, customization uh, uh, framework uh, where they can assign expressions maybe to a particular fields of a data set or maybe to all fields uh, that are considered PII in all of this group of data sets. And we will, at runtime, figure out exactly what needs to be done for each data set. Um, uh, we do provide some templating, uh, so, some, uh, some UDFs that can be used for templating, like figuring out what the default value of a field is, figuring out the timestamp of a row, or perhaps being able to match every single PII field in any data set. Um, OK, so so far we have 
probably the tricky components to uh, to a privacy system. It's figuring out which data sets need to be cleaned. Uh, and there's uh, their metadata, their semantic meaning, which identifiers need to be deleted from these data sets, and uh, this set of SQL expressions that can be used to clean them. From there on, the actual execution of that cleanup uh, may be different. Uh, there are multiple possible implementations for it. And this is, we're going to get a little bit more technical and just talk about uh, our specific implementation. Um, but in some way, it's all a recombination of those three pieces and any other, uh, a variety of other implementations. Um, so let's start from the bottom up. So first, we want to, given uh, a stream of records, we want to figure out, uh, we have a stream of records, we have a consumer. We want to figure out how that consumer can see a clean stream of records. The first thing we need to do is we need to be able to read those records from a data set. And here we use Hive. Uh, as, the, as a reader, we would use a Hive input format. We use table scan operators that naturally iterate over all of the, uh, over all of the records in there. And I will talk about why Hive in a second. Um, the record consumer does not necessarily get Hive objects. You can do apply some other, uh, you can apply a transformation later on to provide them other records or whichever, whatever kind of records, and we will talk about what we use for that. Uh, but uh, critically, we can inject a compliance operator in this table scan. And this compliance operator will see every single row that is read from the source data set and can apply these expressions that, we, uh, that users have provided to either filter out records or modify them as they are being read. Um, so uh, the compliance operator is like the core of, of the compliance framework. It takes a, a number of inputs. It figures out exactly what to do with each record. Uh, these are the four primary inputs, probably. Uh, so obviously, we have the metadata store in the top of the, uh, where that we use to retrieve the metadata for a, part, for a data set. We have the lookup tables that Anthony talked about before. Uh, we have the SQL rules that, again, are dynamically computed and they combine all of the default, uh, the, the, the core infrastructure, and they also combine whatever the users want to customize. And there is a, a, a fourth input in here that we haven't talked about that we call the query context. And that tells us a lot of information about where this consumption is happening. It uh, can tell us like, which data set is being read, of course. That's easy. It also tells us which user is reading the data set, and this becomes relevant when different users should see different versions of the same data. And it can tell us other information, like parse the metadata to figure out uh, which fields have special meanings, uh, or things like that. Um, so once we're able to purge, uh, to clean a stream of records, we can then move on to uh, actually cleaning a data set. Um, and in this case, it actually becomes very simple at this point. We have a consumer, uh, like any consumer can read a clean version of a data set, but then we want to actually keep clean versions of the data sets on, uh, on disk or on HDFS. Uh, but well, once you have this clean stream, you can just write it back into a new file in, uh, and then replace the original files with the new files. Uh, in our implementation, we do this right using the exact same uh, Hive CERD and Hive, uh, the Hive output format. And this allows us to keep all of the semantics of the original data set uh, of the original files in the new files. We will, we're able to keep the same uh, format. We are able to keep the same ordering, same compression, whatever else is, uh, whatever other characteristics the original data set had. And uh, we can even optionally keep the same file names. We can keep the same uh, partitioning, or we can just reorganize the data sets as we write them out. Um, another important component in here, though, is well, sometimes you make a mistake. Uh, sometimes a user may misconfigure their customizations, and you may end up deleting an entire data set. Um, so we do uh, keep a high security zone, uh, let's call it, on, uh, on storage, where we can store uh, some, r some records for recovery. But critically, no one in the entire company should be able to access this data. 
uh, except through special processes. Eventually, after a few days, this data gets deleted permanently. Um, so why did we choose Apache Hive? So we have SQL. We need a SQL uh, engine. There are multiple SQL engines out there. We could have built a new one. That's probably pointless. Um, but actually, both of our teams and, uh, work heavily uh, with Hadoop. Uh, Hive integrates uh, very tightly with Hadoop. Um, something that is, but probably the main uh, benefit here is uh, that Hive has support for a variety of formats in the form of uh, certs and in the form of input formats and output formats, and this allows us to be completely data, uh, completely format agnostic. Like we don't care how your data is stored as long as we can put a Hive table on top of it, we will be able to clean it up. Um, besides that, uh, we have a lot of tooling around uh, Hive. One of the very important ones is what uh, Anthony works on, which is DALI. It's a data access layer at LinkedIn. And we'll talk uh, later about why it is so important. Um, and then the other uh, important open source uh, component that, uh, that we use is Apache Goblin. Uh, I would want to first explain what it is before saying how we use it. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about Apache Goblin, uh, but it's a, it's a distributed data integration framework. The intention is to make a lot of the, uh, a lot of the aspects of big data easy. And this is aspects like ETL, of course. Um, but there are other things like state management, like uh, if you're doing incremental consumption, you need to know where you stopped across different jobs. There is a lot of uh, emitting enough operational metrics and events to know what's going on in your system. And to, uh, to other things like uh, data lifecycle, deleting the, uh, the files, eventually deleting old partitions. And one of the very important parts of Goblin is that it allows you to mix and match uh, different constructs so you can have uh, the, you can have the same readers with different operators in the middle and the same writers, and in this case, the operator, the, uh, our compliance framework is one is a Goblin uh, 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 converter we call it, and that means that well, really, you can read data from any any source for which Goblin has an adapter, and apply the same compliance uh, operator. So once we know what Goblin does in general, and we know how we can purge a single data set, we get into how do we purge an entire data system, in this case, HGFS. So obviously, from the metadata store, we can retrieve a list of all of the data sets that exist. These, as uh, Anthony mentioned, we're talking about 100K data, uh, data sets. Each of them has multiple partitions. So yeah, we could, of course, go and clean them all, all up on the same run. We would probably spend a few days in there. It would probably fail because some of nodes went down. Who knows? Uh, so we prefer to go on a, on a partitioned uh, uh, approach where each iteration of Goblin, we select a few of the data sets that need to be cleaned up. We clean them, clean them up. And then on, on the next iteration, we do another subset of these data sets. And this is where Goblin shines because uh, it's, uh, it's very stateful across executions. And that way, we can make sure that we are always advancing, always cleaning new data sets. Eventually, of course, we have to go back to the same data sets. We say we loop over the data store. Uh, but this is actually very, very easy to do with Goblin. Uh, and then the other thing is that Goblin also has uh, all of these auditing capabilities. It can send events out. And two particular, it sends a lot of events. Two that are particularly important, I guess, are first audit events that say, at this time, we clean the data set. Perhaps we deleted this many records. We modified this many records. We used this version of the lookup tables or this version of the customizations. And this allows us to, to first make sure that everything is actually being cleaned. It allows us to detect when something has not been cleaned for a, uh, for a long time. And well, you really cannot guarantee that your data system is clean unless you have these events. The other thing is uh, the other kind of events that we care a lot about are error events. And sure, you can just notice that there are missing audit events and know that something happened. However, these error events are 
very rich, they're populated with exact reasons that things failed, that the processing failed. And really, you can send them directly to the data owners, and this event will tell them, hey, your data set could not be cleaned, maybe because uh, your UDFs uh, do not compile for your data set. Um, so, and, and that allows us to take, a, to take quick action and, and clean up uh, and re-clean that data set as soon as possible. Um, so this was all focused on how do we keep HGFS clean. Uh, it turns out that the same framework can be used for beyond HGFS, and I will, uh, we will give some other talks about this, in particular in Strata, about uh, more focused on going beyond HGFS. But just a sneak peek of the other things we do. So one of the most powerful uh, tools we have is read site compliance. And this is, uh, I mentioned DALI before, this is where DALI uh, shows its full power. Uh, so just very quickly, DALI is, uh, is a data access layer that we develop in LinkedIn. The point is to abstract away the details of the storage of data sets. Uh, so it doesn't matter what format the data set is. It doesn't matter where it is stored. Uh, you simply, if you're a consumer, if you're a, either a Spark, a MapReduce, any kind of consumer, you create a DALI reader, you tell it, I want to read this data set, and you will get the records. And this is actually very nice because since users already have a layer, uh, a, a high-level layer in the middle, we can just inject the compliance operator into this layer. And this allows a few different things. Uh, one of them is uh, dynamic filtering, where maybe user A is allowed to see certain records, and user B is allowed to see some other records. And we can keep the exact same uh, persistent storage, but the different services will have different views of the same data. Um, it also allows for uh, shorter SLAs. So again, we're talking about a very large data store. It takes, naturally, some time to, to clean up the physical uh, data. But we can immediately apply these, uh, these compliance needs, uh, these uh, privacy needs, uh, as soon as it comes, whenever a service is reading the data. Uh, it also allows for uh, dynamic data obfuscation. So if perhaps your service is sure you, uh, is allowed to see the data, but is not allowed to see the PII in it, well, we can on the fly obfuscate that data. Either we can null out all of the PII, or we can apply uh, consistent hashing, or uh, different uh, depending on the requirements. We can do different obfuscation. Um, the other thing is uh, supporting a purging of generic data stores. Uh, there are different data stores have very different semantics. Some are more appropriate for purging than others. Uh, maybe if you have uh, MySQL or Oracle, you can say just uh, drop all the records where member ID equals one, two, three. Um, but some other data stores are not so easy. And uh, Goblin is a very nice tool in here. Goblin has adapters for multiple data stores, and one of its first uh, functions was to generate dumps of data stores into HDFS. So you can, we can follow a three-step process to clean a generic data store. So first, use Goblin to generate a, a full snapshot of the data. We run the same compliance framework. In this case, not to clean up that file, because that's useless. That's not the original file. But we can use the framework to identify which records exactly need some action on the original store. And then we can use the Goblin again with that same adapter to apply those changes on the original store. Those changes, again, might be drop, our, drop the row, delete the record, or they might be do, do some other changes. Goblin supports uh, all of that for a few formats, and it's very easy to write new adapters uh, for, con uh, for connecting to different stores. Um, so just as a conclusion, let's go back to the initial tenets that Anthony talked about. The, like the four things that we want to be able to do with this compliance framework. So the first one is onboarding should be simple. And the way we solve this is, uh, well, we use Warehouse uh, uh, to, uh, for users to provide the metadata, and users can provide the SQL expression, so anyone can customize how their data sets are cleaned. Second one, compliance should be exhaustive. In this case, Goblin shines. Goblin keeps track of everything that has been processed. It emits a lot of rich events. To, make sure, to let us know that everything is in order. 
The remediation should be fast and easy. Well, we emit audits that let users know very quickly this is exactly what you need to fix. And then we have DALI so that as soon as that fix is done, uh, readers will immediately see the compliant data. And finally, compliance should support heterogeneous data. So in this case, this is uh, the reason that we use Hive. Uh, as long as there's a, a Hive certainty, we can clean the data set. Some resources in here, it's basically just the links to, to three of the products we mentioned in here. Uh, you should take a look. They're pretty cool projects, each of them. Um, some acknowledgments, there were a lot of teams involved in this, a lot of people that could not fit in here, so I had to just pick a few. Uh, but yeah, other than that, thank you. And I think we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, Anthony can come and answer some as well. I think uh, you need to use the mic uh, for questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is mostly about deleting records, right? Do you also have any strategy for uh, preserving like data, like tokenization or uh, stuff like that? So whatever data you get right now, is it is stored without any uh, tokenization or obfuscation, or is it? Only when there is a compliance requirement, you guys obfuscate that. How, how do you guys take care of it? Um, so this, okay. So, so these transformations really, I mean, we talked about the column transformations. And yes, we focus mostly on cleanup, but you can apply any kind of operation to your data. And in fact, you don't need to replace the original data set by the new data set. You can create a copy of that data set with some other characteristics using the same customization and the same metadata information. Uh, so yeah, the idea here was to allow arbitrary compliance operations to be executed on these data sets. And then we're providing the infrastructure. It's up to the applications users or security or whoever else to, f to figure out what to do with it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, one follow-up question to that is, uh, how do you identify, say, uh, there is a person like me, and you guys have a member ID is what I saw, probably a unique key for each member. Mm -hmm. So uh, where is the mapping? How do you guys, how does the operator know the mapping of a person to a member or this relationship when they want to obfuscate the data or delete the data? Uh, so the mapping from what? Like an end user to the actual uh, member ID is what the example you, sh you showed so us, right? Again, we're mostly infrastructure in here. We're okay. assuming. Th so the, uh, the interface to the API to connect to us is through events. Applications teams know their semantics. Applications teams send an event saying, okay. this identifier, this member ID needs maybe this particular kind of cleanup. And so we apply that cleanup. It doesn't matter to <laughs> us uh, what that mapping is. Okay. Got you. Thank you. Hey, it's, thanks for the for the talk. I just have a quick question on regarding on the uh, goblin. So does goblin support different type of the input resource for the ingestion? For example, if I have one, if I want to in, in ingestion from ingest from the third party uh, data from Google, if I have a uh, data from Amazon S3, or I just simply do FTP or SCTP ingestion. Does Goblin uh, support all of those? Uh, yes. Uh, and Goblin has this general interface of a source. As long as you implement the source, you can read data from a particular data source. We have, uh, like if you download the project as it is right now, there are mm -hmm. a large number of sources already available. There's uh, there are uh, sources to connect to AWS, to connect to Oracle, to Salesforce, to uh, many of them. And the idea is you can always write a new one if you have specific needs. Like a new driver for a new? Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, great talk, thanks. Have you thought about, or do you think your strategy that you're doing as far as compliance and, and, and filtering data would work with like Apache Ranger? Um, I have to be honest, I know Apache Ranger is related to this, uh, and there were discussions in uh, LinkedIn about it, uh, but I don't know the details of what yeah. it does, so I cannot answer <laughs> that question. Like, I think um, uh, this um, kind of uh, filtering and compliance we do uh, can be done in addition to um, access controls that uh, Apache Ranger uh, might provide. So you could still have that in place to control 
uh, which uh, users have access to which data sets, and then you can leverage uh, our compliance framework to control uh, the view of the data that each uh, user gets to see. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems time is up, uh, but thank you, and if there are any offline questions, we'll be here for a bit. Thank you. Thank you.